So in this tutorial, I'm going to be talking how, about how you can use Atlas to generate your patient health prediction package for you. So you can actually run multiple models without actually doing any coding. So I'm going to assume that you know Atlas and you know how to add cohorts. If you, if you, if you haven't um, used Atlas before, I recommend looking at the tutorials that are online for Atlas. But the cohort definition on the left hand option here is where you can go to create cohorts. So if we use a cohort definitions, we can see what cohorts are already in the uh, the shared Odyssey Atlas. Now, it's the prediction tab that's actually going to be used for creating our prediction package. So if you go down to the prediction tab where I'm hovering over now, if we get rid of this, go back to the home. So if we go down to prediction here it will now open up uh, the, the prediction models that have already been developed that we can see here. So these are already some, some study settings that people have generated. And if you want to create a new study for patient health prediction, you go to this top right corner where it says new patient health prediction button in blue. So now clicking on this button will give you the option now of specifying your patient health prediction. The first step is to create a name. So I'm going to call this the PLP demo for, and I'm going to save it. So if I save this now with this green button with the with the the disk sign, this will now save the setting. Which means if I exit, so this X here next to the save button, this blue X button, this actually closes this the setting. So I can close, and I can see now I've got this PLP demo on the patient health prediction home section. So if we click onto this PLP demo, I go back into where I was. One thing that might be useful is next to the close, we have this option for copy. So this double letter uh, blue button is actually copying this. So if you wanted to have a copy of a study where you wanted to change maybe a couple of target populations or you want to change some TARS, you want to make some minor edits, it might be good to start from an existing settings rather than from scratch. You can press copy and this will then copy the whole settings you have here. At the moment, we haven't put anything, so it would be a bit pointless. But if you had settings, it would copy it, and then you'd get copy of PLP demo, and you can rename and save the copy. If you don't like your settings, you can always go to this red bin button that, that's the delete. So this delete will now would remove the whole settings that you've got. We're not going to do that for now. Okay, so once you've given it a name, you've now got the prediction problem settings. So here, you specify your target cohorts, and you specify your outcome cohorts. If you're doing a single PLP study, Put one T here, one O here. If you're doing a multiple PLP study, you can put multiple T's, multiple O's. And that's what I'm going to show you in this example. Now you add a target by going over to this add target cohort button on the right side of the target cohorts. And by clicking on this, it's now going to give you an option of adding any of the cohorts you have in your Atlas version you're using. So any cohorts you create in the cohort definitions option in Atlas will now appear here. So if we want to look at maybe a target, uh, a target population of diabetes, we can click this diabetes cohort. Now I'm just picking random cohorts, but when you're doing this, you'd have wanted to create a target population that makes sense for your prediction. And you'd be adding that in here. If we look at some others, we can see that um, we can look at maybe metformin users. It's going to be similar to this diabetes. And let's see what other cohorts we have here. So we can look at the H1BAC users as well. So this means we've got target populations are all linked to diabetes. If you don't want one of these target cohorts, you can use this X dot button here and it will remove it. So we can remove the H1BAC cohort by clicking here. Okay, so now I've got this target cohorts and I've added in two target cohorts from my cohort definitions that are in Atlas. Next bit is the outcome cohorts. So for the outcome cohorts, you go over to the right hand side and you've got this add outcome cohorts and it's going to give you a similar interface to what we just saw if you click on this you've got this option of different outcomes so we can look at maybe acute kidney injury and then let's pick another one let's pick ischemic stroke so we've got two outcomes now two targets and we've got our target and outcome populations all set next step is your analysis settings so this is your model settings your covariate settings and your population settings. So the model settings, these are the different classifiers that you want to apply. You go again, you've got the model settings here. 
we go over to the right, we're going to see this plus add model setting button. If we click this, it's going to take us to a new page where we can specify our model. Actually, first you specify what mod you want, then it tells you the page of the input. So let's do a lasso digit regression. And now it takes us to this page where it has the hyperparameters that you can you can investigate. For this, for lasso digit regression, the default value is 0 0.01 for the uh, regularization value makes uh, a good sense for the starting. So we're just going to press this back. So to go back now from this page, we use this back arrow button that's listed here. By clicking this, we're going to find that this last religious regression with this setting is now going to be added to our setting for the models. So now we have this last religious regression with a variance of 0 0.1. We want to add another model, maybe we want a random forest. It's going to come up with a, a page of all the random forest hyperparameters now. So we've got four different random uh, hyperparameter settings we can put. So if you want to have, um, here is the m maximum number of interactions. We've got 4, 10, and 17. If we wanted to add 2, so we'd, we'd investigate if we had uh, a tree of depth 2, this we could just add a comma with 2 here and it would include that. And then the number of features to include in each tree, minus 1 is the default, which is the square root of the total features. And this is what people tend to default to when they do random forest. But we might want to, if we know we have at least 100 features, also add in 100 here. And then we have the number of trees to build. By default, we use 500, but we might want to change this to 5,000. Or we could add in 1,000 as well. And then whether we want initial variable selection, put true, and we can also put false. We don't want a space there. So now we've got these settings all set for our random forest. Again, we go back with this backwards button here, and our random forest with these settings will be included. So we can see here now we have this random forest setting. And then finally, let's add a gradient boosting machine. And again, this has lots of hyperparameters that we can set. We might want to add in, looking for 500 trees. We might want to, the number of threads, we just want a single value. That's just to do with your computer. I can handle 20, so I can, I'll leave this as it is. And then the number of rows, let's add two. We might have a fit, but let's see. The maximum number of interactions, these either make sense. And the boosting learning rate. We just keep these from that. So now I'm going to use again, go back using this backwards arrow button, and my gradient boosting with the settings I picked will be added. So I've added three models here now. If I didn't want one of these, if I wanted to make edits, you can either click on it. So if I wanted to make an edit to the last video, this is regression, I can click on it, and I could actually say, okay, let's put a zero here, go back, and that will now be edited. If I wanted to get rid of it, I could just press this X. I'm not going to do that because I want these three. And then we've got the covariate settings. So the covariate settings, if you click here, it's going to set up a new page where it has quite a lot of information for, for setting the covariates. So the first one to look at is whether you include, so whether you just restrict to, to a certain set of concepts in your model. So you might want to say, okay, I want to see if I was only including these 100 concept IDs, how well does my model do? And you can create a concept set with those 100 concept IDs and then you can use this load button here. So if we look up the, the far right, there's this folder with a blue button. You can click here and it will take you to all the concepts that you have in your atlas. And you can click on one like this metformin one. And it will say, OK, I'm only going to be doing a prediction model that uses these concept ideas I've defined in this concept set. I obviously don't want to do that in my example, so I'm going to get rid of that. And then you have the option of whether you want to include descendants or not. So if you actually had uh, concepts that's at the hierarchy, you could actually restrict it to um, just the, the, the hierarchy ones, or you could say, let's use all descendants, yes, and it would also pick up all the children concept IDs. Similar to the inclusion, you could also have this exclude. So the exclude is going to say, I don't want these concept IDs. And again, you can pick any concepts that you have created in Atlas or someone else has created in the shared Atlas you're using. And you can say, I want to exclude any concept ID that is in this concept set. And again, you have this descendant option of whether you also want to exclude the descendants of these concepts. Now, the last thing for um, inclusion is this, this covariate ID. So you can also um, restrict to a set of covariate IDs that you want in the model. So a covariate ID is actually a combination of a concept ID and an analysis ID. An analysis ID tells you um, the type of covariate, whether it's a condition and long term, for example. So this is kind of, it requires more knowledge of 
uh, the feature extraction if you're going to use this this is a bit more advanced and i'm not going to talk too much about it but if you've developed a model and you find that there's 10 covariate ids that seem to be the most useful you could just put the list here of those covariate ids and see if i was going to do a simple model of just these 10 covariate ids how well does it do the next bit is the demographics so this is simple you've got gender age age groups race ethnicity index of year and month and some prior observation or post observation time so when you see these options with a box if you click on the box you're going to see a blue tick the blue tick means yes i want that if you have an empty box it means no i don't want that so blue box means yes we're having gender we're having age groups we're having race ethnicity and index month Index month might be handy for seasonality effects index year generally you don't want in prediction because if you're applying this model in the future, you won't have anyone who has the index year you're actually um, going to be applying it to, and it just it, it could cause a lot of issues. So index year generally for predictions it, you don't want, but if you're doing phenotyping, you, you might want to include it, or there might be situations where index year is useful. And again, post observation time you definitely don't want in your prediction model. Uh, prior observation time could be useful in some cases. So here you can just select which ones you want. These, these ones seem reasonable, so I'm going to keep that. Now, your time-bound covariates are the ones that you're actually looking at things. So relative to your cohort start date, you're going to look back either all time prior and all the records the person has. Long term is, is, is a set um, number of days back. So in this case, we're looking 365 days back uh, from our cohort start date. Um, so in the last year, for example, in this case, you can modify this to any number you want. And then medium term, you, again, you can modify this to any number, but its default is looking back 180 days before your cohort start date. So it would just be the records that occurred 100 days before cohort start date up to your cohort start date. And then short term, by default is minus 30. You can change this, but this is like the 30 days prior. The end days is when you actually stop looking um, for the records. So end days of zero means that you're actually including your cohort start date. Um, records in the covariate creation. If you don't want your cohort start date records uh, in your covariates, then you need to put end dates of minus one. If you wanted to have a gap, so for example, if you wanted to have a set period of time where you wanted to actually add an intervention, you might want to put your end days as minus 30, which means that you, you would actually be used doing the prediction uh, with a 30-day with a gap, um, which means that you can maybe actually apply this, this model and say, okay, um, if I apply this model and I've got someone who's got a high risk, there's a 30 days where we can maybe intervene and uh, this might be more useful in terms of, of prediction. So your end days here um, could be used in it for, for, for that situation. Just model by this value by entering what, whatever number you want. And then these values all link up down here. So when you've got now, you've got conditions, conditions groups, drugs and drug groups, you also see that you've got all time prior, long term, medium term, short term. So these times these ones here link up to the times you put here. So if I modified this, it would modify this. If I modified medium term days, it would modify this. If I modified short term days, it would modify this. And again, the blue means we're including it. The white means it's not included. So I might want to remove the overlapping here, but I want drug groups and condition groups, long term and short term, in the last year and the last 30 days. And then we have the conditions, um, drugs, procedures, measurements, measurements, values, observations, devices, visit counts. Again, we have this all time, long term, medium term, short term, and these long term, medium, short term all link up to these values here. And whether we include them. So again, we're going to include all of those in the 30 days and the 365 days prior. And then the distinct counts, it just tells you how many conditions you had, how many condition records you had in the long term. So this gives you information about healthcare utility. So I might want to add this in. Um, and again, I might want to add this into the drugs. And then the final one <clears throat> is your risk or covariate. So we've actually got covariates that calculate the CHAS2, the CHAS-VAS, the chas vas the DS, DCSI, and the Charleston. So we've, we actually calculate these and we can add these as covariates into a model. So you, this means I'm including all of these. And once you're happy with what you selected, you can then, again, go back to this backwards button in the top left, clicking on this, and our covariate settings will be added. If you want to make ed any edits, again, just hover over and click on it, and it will go back to where you were, and you can see the same settings we had. 
If you want to add another covariate settings, again, where the covariate settings option is, if you go over to the right, you'll see this add covariate settings. We add another one. This time, I want to see what's the impact if we don't include drugs. So I can get rid of all the drug ones. So now I'm just going to look at conditions, groups in the last year and 30 days. And I get rid of the risk scores. And I can go back and that's going to be added. So I've got two different covariate settings. Then the population settings, you can go again over to the right hand side. There's this add population settings button. Click on that. You get the option of all your population settings. Now the population settings, you pick your time at risk window. So here we've got one day from cohort start. Now add exposure days to start actually means that this is different. So if you if you add exposure days to start as no, it means you is actually one day from your cohort start. If you add exposure days to start as yes, actually this is the cohort end date. You start one day from your cohort start date in this situation. I want us to go uh, cohort end date from this situation. So add exposure days to start, yes, but then we're doing one day from cohort end date. Now I want to actually do from the cohort start, so I'm going to put no here. And then define the time at risk window end. Again, you pick some value like 365 days from cohort start date. If you wanted to go using actually the cohort end date, you would put yes here and you'd say add exposure days to end. And this would then continue all the way from 365 days to the co uh, from the cohort end date. We want to do cohort start date, so I'm going to put this down to no. So this is saying my time at risk is one day from cohort start all the way to 365 days from cohort start. Now you've got this option here of a minimum time at risk. This is the minimum number of days that someone needs to be observed in the time at risk period. So this is this time at risk value uh, for the end minus the time at risk value at the start. So 365 minus 1 is the maximum number of time at risk days you can have if your exposure start and end is both set to no, none. So this is saying that they have to be, have the full time at risk. If a lot of mistakes some people do is they actually have this set to 365 days because their time at risk end window was 365 days. But because you're starting at day one and not day zero, this means no one would actually have 365 days time at risk. They would only have 365 day days minus one day, which is 364 days. So you would have an error with everyone being removed if you pick this. So you just need to be careful that your time at risk days um, is, is a feasible number based on your time at risk end and your time risk start. Minimum look back apply to target cohort is, is saying that the minimum um, number of days that you have to have uh, prior to your cohort start date to be uh, included. Should subjects with time at risk be removed? Yes. So this is saying if you don't have this minimum time at risk, you get removed. And this uh, this is often useful if you if you want to get rid of some noise in your in your labels. Should only the first exposure per subject be included? Uh, this depends on your prediction. So your type of population could have the same person multiple times on different dates. If you only wanted to pick them once and you wanted the earliest date, then you pick yes here. If you're happy to have people in the type of population multiple times with different dates, select a no here. Include people of the outcome who are not observed the whole at risk period. So this is, a, this is something that I've talk, touched on in, in a couple of other demos. And this is saying, um, Basically, in this situation here, we've got our time at risk starts one day from cohort start to 365 days from cohort start. If someone has the outcome 50 days after their cohort start date, and then they leave the cohort 180 days after their cohort start date, we know they had the outcome during that time. So if the outcome is rare, we might want to include them, or if the outcome is linked to something that would cause you to leave, we don't want to filter these people, so we want these people in there. But when we think about the people who don't have the outcome, if someone reaches a day 180, they don't have the outcome, and then they leave, you don't know whether they would have developed the outcome sometime during the 181 days to 365 days. So if we include non-outcomes that are only partially observed for the time at risk, we could add noise, and we'd be saying people didn't have the outcome when they did. So this is a, it's, it's, it's a tricky situation, in terms of like whatever you pick, there's going to be some bias. So what actually I suggest a lot of the time is is adding population settings when you set this to yes, and adding population settings when you set this to no. So you can see the impact of okay, if we included all the outcome people, 
um, and we didn't include all the outcome people, how did that affect the model? There might be situations, for example, when you're looking at uh, MI that is, is obviously associated to death, where you, you just have to include all the outcome people because otherwise you might be getting rid of people who had an MI and died, um, which, which could really impact your model. Remove patients who have been observed the, the outcome prior to cohort entry. Again, this is optional. Do you want to do a prediction and people have never had the outcome before? Or are you happy if they've had the outcome in, in the past? Yes or no. So in this situation, I'm saying no. So you could have had the outcome in the past and you're still going to be in the target population. So if we go back using this backwards button, you can see the population is, uh, settings now. And I'm going to add another one, for the population settings. But this time I'm going to say, um, I'm actually going to um, say no here. So this means that no one is removed. So if you have partial observation, you're included and you just included the label that you had uh, up to the point you were removed. So if you had the outcome, you're an outcome. If you didn't have the outcome, you, you, you left at day 180 after your, the cohort start, you'd be included as a zero. And that would just give us an, inf an idea of whether there is a difference um, by uh, including people with the outcome and not people who didn't have the outcome. So we go back now and we've got these two different population settings. So we've got three models, two covariate settings, two population settings. The next bit is this execution summary. So sampling, prefer sampling. This is saying, do you want to sample from the target population? This might be useful if you have cohorts that have millions of patients. You might not want to download all of those target population People, you might want to just say sample 10,000. So you can say yes and sample 10,000 and see how, how well the model did on 10,000. If it, it So this is effective, you could investigate feasibility. If it does well for 10,000, maybe don't sample and, and, and rerun it again without sampling so you can train on all the data and see, um, get a model that that, 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 that is uh, hopefully very good. If you sample 10,000 and it, it gets uh, an error in the cover around 0.5, adding more patients is, is probably not going to improve that. Um, it, I mean, it, it could if, if you've got uh, millions of patients that you could be applying it to. Um, you might still want to investigate adding slightly more patients in the sample, but it, it does give you some idea of feasibility. And then you've got, so in this situation, I'm going to say yes, just because I, uh, I want to just do the models quickly and, and get an idea of how well they run. Then mini, min, minimum covariate occurrence, this is saying the minimum fraction of patients that in the type of population who have, who have to have had a covariate for it to be included. So covariates that uh, occur in less than 0 0.001 um, of the fraction of the, of the po population will actually just get ignored or removed because we're saying they're too rare really to be useful. If, 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 if a variable is extremely rare and it's, it's one in 10 million, it's probably not going to be that useful to apply a model uh, that uses that, that variable. So you can set this uh, to any value you want. You might, if you've got a very small target population, you might want this to be smaller or even zero. Normalized covariates, it's generally good to normalize covariates, so I would say yes. Finally, you've got your training settings. So the training settings, you can say how you do in your test range split. So the person split will randomly assign people to a test or train split, but it keeps the fraction of uh, outcome it, it, the same in both train and test splits so you you end up with the same fraction of people with the outcome in the test and train time split will split the test and train on time so you use older data to train your model and newer data to test your model i'm going to use person here and then percentage of your data to be used in the test set i'm going to say 25 percent. so 25 percent will be held out it won't be used for developing the model it's just used for evaluating the performance Number of folds used in cross-validation when you're trying to identify hyperparameter selection. Three folds, uh, it, it's, it's going to be okay if you've got big data. If you've got smaller data, you might want to include this to start, make it maybe 10 or more. And then the seed you're using when you're doing the test train split. I recommend setting this if you're comparing between models of the same prediction problem. Because if you have a different test train split for ADA boost compared to last year's regression, the model's uh, performance is different. Is it because you have a different test range split? You don't know. If you're big, if the data is big, then then hopefully you've got more stable performance. But if the data is small, especially, then you might get a very varied performance on the test range split. So it's good to have the seed set if you're doing the comparison. Okay, so that's all the settings done now. I'm going to go to this green button to save it. So the green desk now is saved. If the green desk is null, that means that you've got everything that you've done um, updated saved. If you make any edit, 
this will then go bright green again. And now we see under the, the option where you've got this PLP demo name, where we've been working on the specification tab, there's also this utility tab here. So we click on the utility tab now that we finished our settings and saved it. We can see that that says, please click the button below to review the full study specifications. So if we click this blue button here, it says click here to review the study specifications. And now we'll show you a table of all the different settings you've got. So for each T and O that you want to do the prediction, the model that you're going to be using, the model settings, the covariate settings, and some time at risk um, information. So this is all contained here. So we've got 48 models that we'll be training if we ran this package. And we can use this here to filter out. So if we wanted to look at the, the lasso logistic regression model settings, we can click here and it will tell us the lasso logistic regression. If we had different time at risk periods rather than 1 to 365, we could click here and it would filter them out for us. So this is the settings you want to review. This just to make sure everything is, is set up the way you want it. If you click the different tabs up here, it will actually um, give you slightly different uh, views of what you're doing. So here you can look at the target and outcome combinations that you're using. And here you can look at all the different analysis settings combinations that you're using. But the full analysis is the one that you want to review. And then once you're happy with this, you can type in a name here. So I'm going to call this the the PLP demo. One thing I want to point out with this this naming here is that this is going to create an R package that you're going to build and then be able to run. R has restrictions on the names that you can have. So you can't have special characters in an R package name. So if you use special characters here, you'll download the package OK, but when you went and go to build it, R is going to tell you no. So you need to make sure when you name here for the package, it, it, you don't use special characters. You make it very simple like PLP demo. Once you called it a name, you can then click on this download study package button that you see below. And this will now download the study package. I'll now have this in my saved direct downloads and I can now open this package into R and build it. So I'm going to go now over to R and show you how to do that.